this problem or that problem. It's just held you back and held you back and you've been restricted and you've had this obstacle and that obstacle and this problem and this report from the doctor and this from the economy and this issue in the relationship and this issue with the job. Some of you, you feel like the enemy has pulled you back and pulled you back and pulled you back and pulled you back. But you know, whenever you declare Jesus as your Lord and you transfer your trust that God, God, you take a hold of the bow. God, you take a hold of the situation. When God takes a hold of it and releases you, whoo! Being your best with Trey Johnson. Hello, my name is Trey Johnson and I want to welcome you to Being Your Best with Trey Johnson. Today we are going to get into God's Word and freedom is going to come into your life. So I want to encourage you to get your Bible, to get your phone, your iPad, your notepad, whatever it is, because we're going to go into God's Word and we're going to see how to walk free from the spirit of oppression. God is saying to you and I, the spirit of oppression is trying to attach itself to his family and it's time for it to stop. So get ready, get your faith up there, expect to hear the voice of God, and let's grow today. We want to welcome you today. I'm excited about what God is sharing with us. You know, if you've been watching the show the past couple of weeks, you know we've been talking about how to overcome the spirit of oppression. Several weeks ago, the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night and he said the spirit of oppression has been trying to hold his family in bondage and it's time for that to stop. Think about what is the spirit of oppression because when, when, he, when he talks, when I say the Lord said just in my heart, I, I woke up out of my sleep and this is just what was going on. It was just very strong on the inside of me. So I began to ask, okay, what does this look like? And so if you've been following with us, we've been going through and dissecting what the spirit of oppression looks like, what it does. But I just want to read a few of the definition of the word oppression. Oppression means extortion, to obtain from a person by force, intimidation, an undue illegal power, cruelly to exercise dominion against. Think about oppression. Oppression is an outside external force. Another definition, an exterior force coming against you means to press upon, overburden, smother, or abuse. Now. When the Lord was talking to me about this, the spirit of oppression is trying to hold his family in bondage and it's time for it to stop. There's a principle that whatever is on the head has a right to get on the body. Now, we know that in our country and in certain companies and certain situations, there are people in leadership that allow, that cooperate with this spirit of oppression. Now think about what the definition of oppress means. It means to subdue. It's an illegal power. So when somebody is in a position of authority and they're using their power illegally, that cooperates with the spirit of oppression to force down, to push down, to subdue, to hold back, to overburden. Now when you look at the word oppression, li listen... Again, some synonyms of the word oppression is abuse, to conquer, to control, to dominate, to manipulate, to an iron hand trying to rule spiritually. In the Webster's Dictionary, it means an unjust or cruel exercise of authority or power, a sense of being weighed down in your body or in your mind. Have you ever felt like uh, you've been just pushed down, held back, an indicator that the spirit of oppression is operating is whenever you start out good. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's in a business. Maybe it's a, whatever you're called and created to do. You start out and, and you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're moving forward. But then it's like this pressure. It, it, it kind of it slows you down and its desire is to still kill and destroy. At one time in this area, you were bearing fruit. You were thriving. You were flourishing. You were increasing. But then it seems like everything just screeches to a halt. That could be the spirit of oppression and operation and its desire is to kill, steal, and destroy. John chapter 10, verse 10. Now, we've been waiting for people in high authority positions to take control of our country. But as children of Almighty God, we're not just a bunch of building gatherers. We're not just a bunch of Bible toters. We're not just a bunch of bumper sticker havers that say, I love Jesus. 
We are more powerful than we've been acting like. We are the body of Christ, not the body of crisis. We have the greater one on the inside of us. We have the Word of God. We have the Spirit of God. We have the blood of Jesus. We have dominion and authority given to us by our Heavenly Father. And we are supposed to first and foremost get free individually from the spirit of oppression. Then locally take dominion and authority. Then statewide, then our nation. So instead of pointing the finger, I wish so-and-so would do this, or I wish so-and-so would do this. No, no, what can we do? Let's break free from the spirit of oppression and be all that we're called and created to be, all for the glory of God. Now look at Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 19. And I want you to think about the spirit of oppression. Is there an area of your life, maybe it's financially, maybe it's relationally, maybe it's in your business. You know that there should be more fruit, there should be more growth there, but it's just not happening. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 says, Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject, uh, subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now think about what's taking place here. Jesus had sent the seventy out. And he said, you heal the sick. You lay hands upon the sick. They come back and they're just ecstatic. They're so full of joy. And they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now the word subject there, when you look at it in the Greek, it paints the picture of a commanding officer. And what they're saying is like, whenever I used your name and I took dominion and authority, it was like a commanding officer and the demons, they begin to get in alignment and obey us just like they obey you. Then Jesus responds to their comment, and he said to them, And I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So I want you to picture what he's saying. They came back and they said, Lord, the demons are subject. They obey us the way they obey you. And Jesus said, I, I saw Satan. In other words, he's saying, I was there in heaven. And I saw when he tried to resurrect himself against the Most High God, I saw the authority, the power of my Father. When he spoke, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And then he uses the word behold. And the word behold is a theatrical word. In other words, he's saying, I was there. I saw what happened. I saw him try to resurrect himself, raise himself up against the Most High God. And I saw the Father speak and I saw him fall like lightning from heaven. He's, in other words, he's saying, I saw the first act and the second act and the third act. And, and the word behold means that now that was great, but this is phenomenal. And he says, I give you authority to trample on snakes, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. He's saying, I was there whenever God, the voice of God, the power of God kicked him out of heaven, heaven to earth. And now because Adam gave his authority and dominion over to Satan, he's the little G God upon the earth. He says, this is phenomenal because the same authoritative voice that kicked him out of heaven is the same authority that's in me. And I've given you the same authority. He says, this is phenomenal. This is great. This is how Jesus is expressing himself. And he says, I give you authority. I give you power to trample over snakes, scorpions. And when he's talking about snakes and scorpions, he's talking about all the, all the demonic that there is. And he goes on to say, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The, 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 the word above all means far above, above Whatever the enemy's trying to do, the power of the enemy is like even though the enemy is advancing or it seems like the enemy is advancing in your life, even though it seems like he's, he's winning the war, he says you need to realize that the same authority that kicked him out of heaven is the same authority that I have, is the same authority that I've given you, and you have the power and authority to put him in his place. What is he telling us that you and I should rise up and take what Jesus died to give us and push back oppression. Instead of oppression subduing us, instead of oppression pushing us down, instead of us not being able to walk in our calling and assignment, he says, you have the power and authority in Christ Jesus. So take your place. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, listen to this. And how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power... 
who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So, so listen to what he's saying, how God anointed Jesus. The word anointed means God hands, God's hand was upon him. How God's hand, anointing means a smearing, a rubbing on. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. The word with comes from a Greek word meta, which means he accompanied. He was in the proximity. He was, he was in, in transference. He was, he was together. God was together. God was filling Jesus. And he went about doing good and healing all. Not this some, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Healing all who were being held back by the devil. Healing all whose mind was shut down, whose body was shut down, whose business was shut down whose relationships were put on hold. He says God was adjacent. God was in him. God was on him. He was anointed by the hand of God. And he went about doing good and healing all. Any sign of oppression, the power of God is greater than the power that's trying to hold you back. The power of God's greater than your mind being blocked down and you feel like you are oppressed because he not only wants you oppressed, but then he wants you depressed. Then he wants you to regress. And regression means you're going to go back to where you came from. If he can't stop you from getting saved, coming from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus Christ, he's going to do everything he can to shut you down where you don't walk in dominion, you don't walk in authority, you don't experience life and life more abundantly. But we've got to draw the line and say, no longer will the spirit of oppression hinder my family, hinder my business, hinder my calling. I'm a child of the Most High God. And the same way he is with Jesus is the same way he is with me. How God anointed Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Now, this word oppressed here in the Greek, it paints the picture of like a wicked king, a tyrant who goes about and he tells people, this is where you're going to live. This is what you're going to eat. This is how much you're going to make. This is what your self-image is. He is trying to oppress, the oppressed of the devil. The word devil is the word diabolos. And it paints the picture that the enemy is taking that lying thought, that oppressive thought, and he is grabbing it and he's going to continue to come after your mind. He's going to continue to come after your thinking. He's going to continue to come after your emotions and to tell you who you are. But God says you are an overcomer. God says you're delivered. God says you're healed. God says you're victorious. God says you're the head and not the tail. How God went about, Jesus went about doing good and healing all, all who were oppressed by the devil. Now let's keep going here. What, when he says God anointed Jesus, Isaiah 10, 27, it says, The anointing of God removes burdens and destroys yokes. Remember, the anointing, it refers to no longer being in bondage, that you got so full of the Word of God. In some translations, it represents fatness. In other words, there's so much prosperity that the yoke can't fit upon your neck any longer. The burden cannot hold you down any longer. Because of the anointing, it removes the burden and it destroys the yoke destroys it. In other words, there's no more, no, no more remnant of it. It's not there. He says because the anointing, it's the presence of God. It's the power of God. It's the life of God in you and on you that God is looking. His eyes are looking to and fro over the whole earth, looking for someone who he can show himself strong on their behalf. I don't want him to look any further. How about you? I want his eyes to stop when he looks in your life. He looks at your family and he says there's faith there. And the anointing of God gets so strong on us, we bust out of every area of bondage in our life. See, the anointing of God removes burdens and destroys yokes. And if you're a born-again child of God, that same anointing that was upon Jesus is the same anointing that is in you and on you. I believe that you're getting a lot out of today's teaching and I want to encourage you to go to the website TreyJohnsonMinistries.com and, and order this teaching today. Get it in your heart. Lift your thinking. Lift your believing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And you know what? While you're there, I want you to pray about becoming a partner with us as we take this Word around the world. Every person that's saved, healed, and delivered, set free, you're a part of that. TreyJohnsonMinistries.com. Thank you for being a part.
He's in you. His presence is in you and on you. Listen to this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 and 27 in the Amplified. It says, but you have been anointed. That's you. You have been anointed. We've got we've to take ownership of this. I have been anointed. It goes on to say, you hold a sacred appointment from. You have been given an unction from the Holy One. And you all know the truth and you know all things. Verse 27, but as for you, the anointing, the sacred appointment, the unction which you receive from Him abides in you permanently. The anointing which you receive from Him, you didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it. All you did is simply receive the anointing of God. The same anointing that was in and on Jesus is the same anointing that's in and on us. And its design is to remove every burden and destroy every yoke. And oppression is a burden. Oppression is a yoke. Don't let that wicked king tell you any longer who you are and what you will have and where you will go. You tell him. Remind him of his defeat. Remind him that he's a loser. <laughs> he's a loser. Greatest loser there's ever been, the greatest loser he'll ever be. Remind him of the back of the book. Remind him that he lost his rights to rule and reign in your life. He no longer can oppress you because you're no longer owned by him you're owned by God Almighty through Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, listen to this. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me. The anointed one, the Messiah, to preach the good news, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to announce release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to send forth as delivered those who are oppressed. He says the good news, it is good news that you no longer have to be oppressed. It is good news that you no longer have to be broke. You no longer have to be sick. It is good news that if you've been shut down and held back, the anointing of God in you and on you is designed by God to thrust you forward. Think about the purpose for the anointing. 1 John 3, 8, it says, For this reason the Son of God was manifest, visible, was to undo and destroy and loosen and dissolve the works the devil has done. He says, for this reason, the Son of God was manifest to destroy, to loosen, to dissolve. The anointing of God obliterates. It destroys the evidence of the enemy. Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. So what does this oppression look like? How does, how does oppression attach itself to our life? Because there can be different levels of oppression. There can be different layers of oppression. There's, it, it, and, and so how does it start? It starts with the lie of the enemy that comes directly towards your mind. And he begins to lie to you. Remember, it's the oppression of the devil, devil diabolos. He takes this lie and he's going to stay consistent and steady at your mind until you get weak, until you get broken down. And then it goes from your mind down into your heart and then you believe it and whatever you believe becomes your reality. Whether it's really God's will or not, the choice is yours. The thought comes, the enemy lies and then what does he do? He, he brings somebody else to back up the lie. See, for me, for example, I have a lot of these examples. But when I was born, my toes touched my heels and I had to go in and break all the bones and stuff in my feet. And as a, a little boy, I was in wheelchairs a lot and had pins and always in cast. And so, I, you know, the enemy would always tell me, you know, you're strange, you're different, you're retarded, you're all this, you're all these different things. And then he would influence other little kids to, to call out, hey, retard, hey, 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 and they just go on, hey, freak, hey, all this type of stuff. What was he trying to do? He was trying to hold me back from being who I'm called and created to be. He was trying to shut me down, to overburden me to, to subdue me and he even then influences people that have an influential voice whether it's a teacher whether it's a minister that you look up to I, I know in the rodeo world you know I compete at the top level in the ministry we're reaching a lot of people around the world and and I've had I've had ministers tell me there's no way you can minister and do everything you do and do leadership and do all this type of stuff and I've had cowboys tell me there's no way you can compete at the highest level and do everything that you're doing see and I've even had ministers you know write me letters well how come this is not happening how come this is not happening and how come you did you know you should be doing more and all this type of stuff. What is that? That's the enemy influencing voices of authority to try to shut you down. Family members, friends, spouses, 
I hate to say it, but we can't point the finger at other people and what are they doing and how come they're doing No, no, no. God gave you, me, dominion and authority over us. We've got to take responsibility for our rights as children of God. So think about it. He comes to lie and then he comes and he influences other voices to confirm the lie. Whatever it is, you'll never make money, you'll never be good enough. Whatever the lie is, consistently consistently coming at you, trying to strike your thoughts and trying to strike your emotions until you begin to believe the lie. And then he even has you look at reality, look at the natural. It's confirming what they said. You are a freak. You are different. You'll never have this. Look at your life. It's a mess. Designed to push you down. Designed to hold you back. So how, how do we overcome this? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. For, I'm going to repeat it here. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. When you look at this in the Greek, the weapons of our warfare, you can look in your own time, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, and it goes through and it just talks about the armor of God. And it talks about how God has created the armor. It's not just a good Sunday school lesson. He created the armor for you and I to win. And when we're operating in our weapons, it is, it is as we're moving forward as the mighty army of Almighty God. And God doesn't think lose. He doesn't think oppression is bigger than Him. He doesn't think the devil wins. He gave you the breastplate of righteousness for you to win. He gave you the shoes of peace for you to win. He gave you the sword of the Spirit. He gave you the belt of truth. He gave you the helmet of salvation to win. It says the weapons we have, they're mighty. Say that to yourself. It's mighty, mighty through God. Mighty, the mighty weapons of God. And he goes on to say, what, what's the purpose of the mighty weapons? To pull down strongholds. The word stronghold, it paints a picture of a castle. It paints a picture also. So what does a castle do? Uh, a, a, a fortress. It keeps people from the outside from getting in, but also a stronghold holds you in captivity. And so even when people that are full of truth show up in your life, like this message, if you have a stronghold, it can't get in until you are willing to pull it down. The word pull it down, the stronghold means you're going to take brick by brick or thought by thought and you're going to demolish it. The anointing of God removes burdens and destroys yokes. You're going to hit, notice what he says. It says, casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought every thought into the obedience of Christ. Now studies say we think between 70 and 100,000 thoughts a day. And God tells you and I that we have the ability to bring every thought into captivity. This, this paints a picture in the Greek of somebody taking a spear and when that thought comes, the lie comes, you have the ability to grab that thought and line it up with the Word of God. And if it doesn't agree with the Word of God, it doesn't belong in your mind. If it doesn't agree with the Word of God, it doesn't belong in your heart. If what the enemy is saying, and it is a lie, and it doesn't agree, you bring it into captivity and you make it line up with the Word of God. So when he says you're a loser, you say, no, God always causes me to triumph in Christ Jesus. You've got to open in your mouth. You can't sit there and have mental gymnastics in your mind and go back and forth with your mind thinking, I'm just going to win and I'm going to battle it and all. Oh, you won't do it. You've got to open your mouth. How did Jesus overcome Satan in the wilderness? He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. He opened his mouth and God is saying, you've got the authority, you've got the armor of God. Open your mouth and use the weapons of your warfare, which is mighty. When you begin to use it, he says, he just doesn't see you. He sees you you moving as a mighty army for the glory of God. 
So when this lie comes, it's backed up by other people, it's backed up by influential voices, it's backed up even by the natural, and you're seeing all this. Its design is to shut you down, to hold you back, to steal, kill, and destroy, to get you to a place of hopelessness. And if you're born again, child of God, you always have hope. There's always a solution. There's always a way out. And it is a good plan, a good way. And he says, so this is what you do. When that thought comes, you pull it down. When that thought comes, that argument comes, that imagination comes. See, there's two, two types of thinking, two types of, uh, there's, there's logical thinking and there's illogical thinking. There's rational thinking and irrational thinking. Now, it's very good to have a logical mind, but a logical mind, please hear me, can talk you out of your obedience. In other words, everything has to make sense. You have to have every I dotted, every T crossed, and that's good. Do your homework. Do it. See what you need to do in the natural. But always submit a logical way of thinking to the voice of God. Because when God tells you to get out of the boat, your mind is going to say, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. Whenever God tells you to do something impossible, the man with the withered hand, he didn't say, I understand where you're at. He says, stretch forth your hand. And he'll, a, a, a logical way of thinking would say, I can't, I can't, I can't. He told Moses, lift up your rod. That didn't make sense. Are you kidding me? Pharaoh's behind me, the Red Sea's in front of me. You're telling me to, to lift up my rod? That doesn't make sense. See, it's good to think through things, but always keep it submitted to the Holy Spirit. Then irrational thinking is that you're, it's just irrational. Maybe, maybe you are a very skinny person, but you think you're fat. Being free from the spirit of oppression, it, it's a game changer. It's life changing for your business, for your family, for your calling, for your assignment. Now you can identify when you're feeling that heaviness, when you're feeling that outside resistance, and what to do with it. You know, but in order to do that, It's important that you're in the family of God. It's important that you have it settled that you're a child of God. You're not just a good person. At some point in time in your life, you've called upon the name of Jesus. So if you've never done that, I'd like you and I to pray a very simple prayer together. No matter where you're at or what you're doing, you can be certain that the life of God enters you. You come out of the kingdom of darkness and you come into the kingdom of Jesus Christ You're a new person on the outside. Your past is forgiven and your whole future is ahead of you. So would you pray this very simple prayer with me if you'd like to make Jesus Christ your Lord and personal Savior. It goes something like this. Just say, Father God, today is the day that I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead to give me life. And right now, I accept that life And I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart, to be my Lord, and to be my Savior. When you said that prayer, according to God's Word, you received forgiveness. You called upon the name of Jesus. He entered into your life. The old is gone. The new has come. I want you to write us. I want you to text us. I want you to email us. Whatever it is, let us know about the decision that you just made. We want to connect with you and help you walk in victory in every area of your life. Hey, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. This is Trey Johnson. Till next time, God bless you.